good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, I don't have to repeat my own name. Uh, well, as Martin already told me, I'm, I'm working here already for many years, and especially in the 1990s, before I uh, was working in the master's programs, I did with my colleagues and with uh, the students an enormous amount of projects, for small businesses especially. And uh, the emphasis on, of these projects was on monitoring. So what we often did was we, uh, we monitored and we, uh, the, com the computer era came up these days and I had some expertise with computers and so on. So that was actually my, uh, my main domain. And we used that for writing marketing plans and product plans and so on, communication plans, strategic plans for public halls, for example. Uh, then I made a sidestep to the master programs, but now I'm back in, in research, so to say. Uh, we have established a research center at our university that is focused on scenario planning, on future studies, because the businesses we worked with in the, in the past, in the 1990s, increasingly had a feeling that they know a lot about what happens and, and, and the trends and so on, but they need more support to look to the future. They're puzzled, they're puzzled by what, uh, what the future developments are and how they should react to it and, and anticipate these future developments. So this, this short lecture this afternoon will be about scenario planning and future studies. I will share a little bit with you and give you a little bit of feeling of how entrepreneurs sometimes think and what they feel and how they are puzzled. So the first question I would like to ask to you is try to imagine you're snow white and you fall into a deep sleep. If you want, you can close your eyes. So I give you a minute to consider a little bit about uh, what might happen. Suppose you will wake in 2014. So after, let's say, a, a little bit less than 30 years. What will be then? Uh, how would the world look like by then? So I'll give you a, a few seconds to think about that. Well, I, I, I hope you have thought a little bit about it. Uh, normally we do the, this kind of things in workshops. I want to make it a little bit interactive. So I would like to ask you, who of you uh, would think that the euro will have disappeared in 2014? 40 or 14? 14. <laughs> so, 20 years from now. Well, about half. Who of you might think that uh, half of the Netherlands will have disappeared because of the rise of the sea level? <laughs> Well, about a quarter of you. Uh, who of you uh, thinks that we can download our memory from our mind to a computer in 2014? Well, that's about two thirds. Probably because you've seen it on television last Sunday. Uh, another question could be who would think that we will be immortal in 2014? That's more difficult. I see no hands at all. So this is very complicated. I see that you are divided, that, that not everybody agrees. That means that we're not completely certain about uh, these, such kind of future developments. Actually, it is even worse, because if we look at today's society, uh, especially since uh, the 1980s, we live in, in, in a world that has changed dramatically because of the globalization. And one of the things that we have to take into account is that we are living in exponential times. That means that the developments we are faced with are increasing with an enormous speed. So in other words, what happened uh, in the past years, for example in a period of 10 years, will happen in 3 years in the years to come. So the speed of developments is enormous, and especially in technology. And technology drives a lot of other developments in our society. Uh, Maybe you've heard about Moore's law, which says that uh, well, the, the growth of technology is uh, growing exponentially. So indeed, Ray Kurzweil predicts that man and machine will melt together in the 2030s already. And as I already mentioned last Sunday, it was on television that there are futurists who predict that we can download our memory to the computer and make it empty for something new. Such kind of developments are driving many other developments in our society. Exponential growth. So that means that if we're used to rely on developments and trends that we, we, that we know, it is quite risky, quite dangerous to do that in the years to come, because the world might change. 
Another development that happened since the globalization of our society is that the world has become hyper-connected. Everything on our world, in our economies, is connected with each other. And that means that, uh, thanks to a sudden event, uh, the power of one of these balls in the complete network might change at the cost of others. So, in, in, the, in the balanced system, uh, a sudden development uh, might have an enormous change and impact on all the other elements in the system. That's something we have to take into account. Another issue, as I already mentioned that, is uh, sudden events, wild cars. This is the attack on the Twin Towers. Such developments, such events that happen worldwide could have a major impact on, on, on the world and on this system that I just mentioned. It turns the world completely upside down. We have had a SARS epidemia that we have now, maybe is coming up again. We have the economic crisis. We had the fall of the Berlin Wall. We had, for example, Rosa Parks, the first black lady who didn't want to stand up for a white in a public transport. All such events happen every day and they have an enormous impact on what the world is experiencing. And especially if you take into account uh, that the developments and the interconnectedness of everything. So we have to be aware of that. So if we think of companies or businesses or tourist destinations, how they have to deal with these issues, that is difficult. They are puzzled with these things. Like I just asked you uh, with a Snow White question, you are also divided in the answers you give to me if we think about the Euro. We didn't even talk about uh, peak oil, for example. Maybe in the 2040s there's no oil left. And we have to rely on completely new energy resources. Maybe shale gas. I, know, I don't know. That's coming up at the moment in the media. So the question is, how can we make destinations, how can we make uh, businesses or health sectors future-proof? How can we resist such changes or make ourselves resilient and flexible enough to be able to handle it in the years to come? One traditional way of dealing with such issues is with forecasting. So uh, a few decades ago, uh, experts, statisticians, and this is also what I was working on, put all kinds of developments in co computers and graphs, and with the help of statistics, we try to make predictions, we try to make forecasts. And this statistical terms, you could, would call it trend extrapolation. So what we did, we counted all kinds of things, and like I did in the 1990s, also with monitoring that I just told you. And by putting it into graphs, we were familiar with trends. And still, in strategic management, you see that trends are very important. All kinds of trend reports are written, and, and uh, strategic managers like to consume trends because I think it's very important for their business and strategic management. And the result is that if you would make scenarios, that you come up with a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, or an optimal scenario. And uh, uncertainty is actually uh, not so much preferred. It, it's, it's, you want to get rid of it. So that's why you make a band with three kinds of scenarios. But if we think of today's contemporary uh, strategic management, you have to forget this approach. This is, I would not say an outdated approach, but there's other approach gradually emerging, whereas this is still what is taught to you in books. The other approach is that we don't take the trends, the certainties, as a starting point, but we take the uncertainties as a starting point. So the questions I just asked for you, to you are the questions we raised to the business. We asked to the business and we asked them what kind of developments, what kind of uncertainties are for you the most important for the, the success of your business in the years to come? What are the driving forces and the key uncertainties? And these uncertainties are used as a starting point to create scenarios. And of course we don't put the trends aside, they're still relevant, but we use them to elaborate the scenarios. So what we do is we don't make alternative futures of one trend, but what we do is we, pick, we paint uh, qualitative pictures of how the future could look like in, in qualitative words and, and images and, and maybe smell and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, films or whatever. And, uh, well, to give you an example of, of how it works, uh, the north of the Netherlands, that is uh, in the circle, in this circle on, on the map here, is, uh, has the airport in Groningen, the city of Groningen, has uh, got the permission to extend its airstrip, and that just finished uh, recently, last month. That, uh, that means that uh, low cost carriers like Ryanair are all of a sudden able to fly to this destination, to the destination of Groningen. 
And of course, this gives opportunity for people who live in the north to travel abroad to other destinations. It also has the possibility of reaching new tourist markets for tourists to come to the Netherlands. And this is what, that is what we investigated. So, for example, there are flight connections with Aberdeen in Scotland, with Barcelona, with Marseille, and with Milano, Bergamo. So what we have done is we have investigated uh, in these areas, in these urban areas, the, the, the willingness of people to travel to countrysides like in the north of the Netherlands. And we put that into the scenarios that you see here. So what we did with the experts in tourism in the north, we discussed, like I did just with you in the beginning, I discussed, uh, or we discussed, what the key uncertainties are for the future of tourism in the Netherlands. We came up with one uncertainty, people are having specific interest in the north itself, because it has something to offer that does not exist elsewhere, anywhere else. Or people have just a generic interest in leisure and tourism or recreation and accidentally end up in the north of the Netherlands because of marketing efforts that pulls them there. We don't know what kind of people we might expect. On the other, the other uncertainty is, do we focus on slow tourism that fits very well in, in the north and the countryside, uh, rural tourism and so on? Or do we focus on fast tourism, or you could also say, call it mass tourism. If you combine the extremes of these possible developments, these uncertainties, we call it uncertainties, and that means that we don't know the direction in which it develops, we create four scenarios. And what we do next is we try to visualize with the stakeholders, with the people in tourism, what a UNESCO destination would look like, what a low-cost destination would look like, what a jet set destination would look like, and what a nature destination would look like. So what we do is we try to visualize it, we discuss it, we talk about it, and we get, try to get all kinds of association that people get into their mind. The advantage is that you don't start with what we know, the trends that we know, but we, we start with something that we do not know. And because we start with something that we do not know, it gives more creativity, it, ge it generates creativity, it, it forces people to think out of the box. And that means that uh, scenarios can be used as a source of inspiration. So what you do then, for example, is for the scenarios that you come up with, that you start to talk and th think about uh, with the stakeholders about the possible implications of the different scenarios. So we make a kind of implication tree, we make a complex diagram of direct and indirect uh, implications. And then we, what we do is, which implications are for you an opportunity? The green ones that are stick at the other green. And which uh, implications would be a threat or, or would be negative for you? But with actually with scenario planning you focus on the positive. <coughs> like in the traditional SWOT analysis you always talk about uh, threats also, but this is something about the future. So we can try to create the future that we want by focusing only on, on, the, on the green, on the, on the positive implications. What we could also do is look at the conditions. So how could we, what, what are the conditions that are necessary, that are required to, to be able to, to create these implications that we want or the scenarios that we want. That means that from the future situation 2040, we make steps to go to today. And by doing that, we can create policy, we can create strategy in a completely different way than we're used to. And by doing this, yeah, you, you can uh, create a new vision, a new strategy. You can comp uh, yeah, develop completely new concepts, for example. If you only react to trends that you're familiar with, all the companies, all the businesses do more or less the same. So it doesn't make a difference. But, but, but by looking towards the future, and try to visualize what this specific group of stakeholders sees in the future, you try to create something that is not easily to be copied by others. So you create your own reality, and from that you start to create new concepts, new business models, and new visions. Uh, there's one other concept, or one other uh, scenario cross that I would like to show to you, and that's also where I would like to end my presentation. Uh, for example, the, 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 the water sports sector in this province is facing difficult times uh, with regard to youth, the interest of youngsters. Uh, so they feel a kind of decline of the interest for young people to go water sporting. 
Uh, we have uh, done uh, sessions with about 70 entrepreneurs and uh, with uh, panels with youngsters. And what we did is, again, we tried to define the key uncertainties. And we found that uh, the water sports sector often is looked, uh, looking inwards. So they try to make solutions themselves. But there's also opportunities for the, the, the water sports sector to cooperate with other leisure sectors, like the hospitality industry or the events industry, for example. And on the vertical axis, you see another uncertainty, and that's if we did investigations into what internationally to what the youth exactly wants. And then you see there's two kinds of youth, to put it simply. Uh, youth that wants, is looking for entertainment during their holiday, and uh, youth that wants to be active. And of course, they also have combinations. But that leads to uh, four different scenarios. And uh, if I now return to the, the question I started with, uh, Snow White. I think it's, it's clear that we cannot predict the future. Scenarios are no predictions, but uh, we can only uh, get a, a flavor of what the future could hold for us. And by anticipating what the future could hold, we can use the scenarios as a source of inspiration. Thank you very much. <laughs>